Welcome to this Sunday's service from St. Columbus Church in Ennis County, Clare, with the churches of Kilnasula and Christ Church, Spanish Point. By chapter 17 of Luke's Gospel, we are now approaching the end of what is called the journey narrative. Jesus' disciples will soon welcome him into Jerusalem for some brief moments of triumph. And so it is fitting that the main focus of his teaching now moves to them. By now his audience is well primed to favour the poor over those of riches and privilege. But just because you might be considered among the blessed poor, Jesus warns them, don't think for a moment that you are exempt from responsibility and judgment. Even in the kingdom there is opportunity for scandal and the need for repentance and forgiveness. How might that warning apply to us as individuals and churches in our own time and under very different circumstances? And so we start our service. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You are the never-ceasing open gift of love. We turn in upon ourselves. Lord, have mercy. You live beyond all centres of power. We seek to enclose your grace. Christ, have mercy. You rejoice in a multitude of names. We try to pin you down. Lord, have mercy. May the power of heaven protect us this day and circle us with the blessing of peace. May Christ, our Lord and loving friend, protect us this day and circle us with affection and love. May the Spirit of Truth, who dwells in our hearts, protect us this day and circle and fill us with joy. And so we pray. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our lives' end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Psalm 37. Psalm 37 Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass, and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Now hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you are thrown into the sea, then for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day, and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. 
The Lord replied, If you had faith the side of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from ploughing or tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me, while I eat and drink later? You may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In chapter 17 of Luke's Gospel, we are now approaching the end of what is sometimes called the journey narrative. Jesus has been preaching and teaching mainly around the shores of Lake Galilee, sometimes on the Jewish side, sometimes escaping to the Gentile side when his opponents become too threatening. His disciples will soon welcome him into Jerusalem for at least some brief moments of triumph before events take a terrible turn, and so it is fitting that the main focus of his teaching now moves to them. By now his audience has been well primed to favour the poor over those of riches and privilege. Not a hard sell, as most of his listeners will themselves be impoverished, sustained to a large part only by their faith. Whereas the rich are typified as lacking in both compassion and faith, loving only money and privilege. Favoured by the world, perhaps, but severely deficient in divine eyes. But, just because you might be considered among the more blessed poor, Jesus warns them, don't think for a moment that you are exempt from responsibility and accountability. Even in the kingdom there is opportunity for scandal and the need for repentance and forgiveness. So Jesus stresses to his followers that they are subject to both. They cannot plead innocence just because they are oppressed by others. No one is issued a free or easy pass. And so he goes on to list a number of distinct but related short sayings about the practice of faith and its protection. High on the list of sins for a person of faith is that through their words or actions they may shake and injure the faith of another. Of course, the way the world is now, Jesus seems to be saying, when the kingdom remains a hope as yet unrealised, there will be times when one's own faith is tested, sometimes even close to breaking point. But there can be no excuse for someone who inflicts such distress on someone else. And this warning remains as compelling today as it ever was. How many countless people have approached a church either out of curiosity or with a wounded or wavering faith, only to encounter such a lack of welcome, or even thinly veiled hostility, that they soon left, never to return. Any spiritual comfort that they might have received negated by the behaviour of the so-called faithful. This is a significant challenge for all priests and congregations as they seek, one hopes, to conform themselves to the teachings of the gospel. Now, it is hard enough to preach the faith when the church is so often perceived by those outside its walls to be stubbornly clinging to outdated and widely refuted precepts, deemed at best antiquated and at worst toxic. How much more difficult if the community does not appear to live out the praiseworthy principles it claims to espouse. The much celebrated theologian and Pauline scholar, Anglican Bishop Tom Wright, once cautioned how first time visitors to a church might exclaim, Well, if that's how God's representatives behave, I suppose the whole thing's a waste of time. 
In one of the most graphic descriptions of punishment anywhere in the Gospels, Jesus warns that it would be better for a millstone to be placed as a collar around the offender's neck, dragging them to the bottom of the ocean rather than face their rightful punishment for damaging a person's vulnerable faith. However much the language is couched for a dramatic effect, this is still surely a salutary lesson for Christians, as we are called to reflect upon any past ill-chosen words, petty arguments, and inconsiderate or even occasionally mean-spirited actions within our church communities that, unbeknownst to us, have killed another's faith forever. And not just their faith, For churches can get a reputation for being unfriendly and dysfunctional in a way that is very hard to shake off as the wider community have long memories and take years to recognise improvements. Meanwhile, unknown numbers of people are lost to the faith. But Jesus then supplements this severe teaching by stressing the continuing need to offer forgiveness. If someone hurts other Christians, yes, they are to be rebuked, but then forgiven if they are truly contrite and ask for compassion. And they must keep on being forgiven despite repeat offences, and not just grudgingly, not with a repressed anger and resentment or a sense of moral superiority, but with a genuine willingness to help them reform to recover humility and tenderness in their faith. Above all, to help preserve them in their faith journey. And those who forgive are not to become unduly prideful. They are not to congratulate themselves on their magnanimity, for this is but the minimum requirement, the expected standard, the baseline of being a Christian. And in the last teaching in today's Gospel. Jesus underscores this point with added vehemence. Perhaps not surprisingly, some of the disciples realise that all this will require more faith than they think they have, and if it feels uncomfortable, even deflating for us, how much more so for those who received the teaching directly from Jesus himself. And indeed, he is quick to respond. Don't obsess, he says, about the greatness of your faith, that way can only lead to arrogance and pride. Instead, consider the relationship between a master and their slave as a guide. We should remember that in Jesus' time, slavery was not essentially based on race, but on power and wealth versus poverty and oppression. Although sometimes slaves could indeed earn their freedom in their later years. Nevertheless, whilst bound to their master, they earned no wages or reward. Jesus asks the apostles to imagine what work an owner would expect from a slave, especially as many masters would have only one, who would work both in the fields and at home. They would not be expected to relax whilst there was work to do, nor would a slave expect to be thanked or paid for performing their regular duties. In the same way, Jesus instructs all those who seek to live out the gospel never to feel that however hard we work, whatever we have given or given up, we have acquired some superior status, or that God is now somehow in our debt. Instead, whatever we contribute to the kingdom, we must remember that all genuine service to God should be performed in a spirit of thankfulness, not to earn special favour and certainly not to ask, what's in it for me? When Jesus uses the word worthless, it is not that we are intended to lack a proper sense of self-worth or self-love. We are not unvalued or unloved. Instead, the original Greek word conveys more the sense of those to whom nothing is owed, to whom no favour is outstanding. So we are to remember that our faith and our practice 
of it is an obligation honoured, not a payment earned. In many ways, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the trials, the disappointments and the suffering to come, and to contrast themselves with the Pharisees, who he holds in such contempt for preening themselves as defenders of God's word, while not fulfilling its most basic demands. Faith, he is making clear, is neither a port in a storm, a compensation, or a reward. At times it can provide some measure of peace, yet at others real and painful challenges that cause us to question, am I strong enough? But it is an engagement with transcendence and truth, a journey into ultimate all-transforming reality, a home of healing and wholeness and a true welcome to which we are called and a journey from which we cannot flinch. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life, therefore let us remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. Holy God, by your grace you have called us, not as we deserve, but in your goodness and generosity. Guard and protect us in our vocation, that we may be strong in faith and serve you in joy and love. We pray for the healing ministry of the church, for those who offer counsel and therapy, for groups that meet to pray for healing. We remember hospital and hospice chaplains and for the work of the church with the healing professions, both ministering with them and to them. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for the healing of the nations, for the cure of past hurts, the forgiveness of past sins and animosity, and that all may seek opportunities to make peace and a new start. We hold before you communities broken by war, hatred and suspicion, remembering not only the people of Ukraine, but also so many parts of our world where media attention is not focused, but violence and oppression are daily occurrences. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for our homes and communities to which we belong and commit to exploring how we may feed and nurture them, how we might serve them according to their needs. We pray for families who are suffering from a breakdown in their relationships, for children who suffer and for those taken into care. We pray for the broken-hearted and the lonely. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We ask you to bless all who are disoriented or distressed, all who are suffering from harm to their well-being. We pray for all those whose faith has been shaken and undermined by the words and actions of others. All those whose joy of living has been undermined by fellow Christians through design or indifference. We bring before you all who will go into hospital or care today, all who may suffer strokes, heart attacks or the sudden onset of illness. Christ be with us, around 
and beside us. We give thanks for all who have passed through brokenness to the fullness of joy and peace in your kingdom, where sorrow and pain are no more. We ask you to bless friends and loved ones departed. Christ be with us, around and beside us. Now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers for those on our hearts. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May we remain open to wonder and mystery to what is strange and new and precious in each child of God, that with Christ and all the Holy Ones we might walk in the light of hope. And the blessing of God, the Holy Trinity, be with you and remain with you and all those whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.